Good evening, everyone. Today we are on the continuation of IIT, one of the most important unit of IIT, that is unit two, of course, and the next part of it, which comprises all about the new economic reforms which are adopted in the year 1991. Children, it's usually talked about, that is the changes occurred in Indian economy in the year 1991. Before I start with the topic and the chapter, I would like to talk to you regarding some fun facts for that period, that in 1991, India faced a serious economic crisis, which pushed India towards a serious economic or financial crunch, which forced Indian economy to borrow the money from IBRD or World Bank. And the finance minister of India that time was Dr. Manmohan Singh. Under his guidance and supervision, India was forced and definitely I would say was ready to compromise on the conditions put by the World Bank. Although it was not only a reason to adopt the new economic reforms, there were many other reasons. As written on your screen, this is one of the questions also, that which factors were responsible for the adoption of new economic policies in the year 1991? As majorly I mentioned that one of the reason was the condition put forward by the World Bank for forwarding or offering the loan of 7 billion USD children. Please look at the screen carefully. These two are the one mark questions. The first is, the World Bank offered the loan amount of 7 billion USD, which was against certain conditions put by IBRD, IBRD, which is commonly or popularly known as World Bank. Actually, this is a very wide concept. We don't need to go inside, but just need to remember that IBRD together with IMF had put the condition to make Indian economy an open economy, which had remained a closed economy so far. But other than this, there were many other reasons in Indian economy itself, which forced India to consider the condition put forward by the World Bank. The first was, there was a serious lack of foreign exchange reserves. You have studied in macroeconomics how important foreign exchange reserves are. So to maintain foreign exchange reserve, was very important for Indian economy as well as we had to make multiple kind of payments like payments for the purchases of petroleum and many more. But we could not maintain the foreign exchange reserves. This forced the Indian economy to become an open economy and therefore we adopted globalization. Then comes our financial institution, including RBI and the commercial banks and many more financial institutions were in serious losses. The losses in these financial agencies were sufficient to put forward the Indian economy towards depression. So to fight with the depression, it was very important for the Indian economy to make Indian economy uh, or convert Indian economy into a liberalized economy and globalized economy so that we could make the financial institution of India stable. During the period of 80s and 90s, Indian GDP was not in a proper shape. It was not showing any growth further. Because of these reasons, productivity in India was highly affected. And you know this very well. You have been studying about the concept of inflation as written over here. Inflation is a situation where the demands are much more than supply. This was a period when GDP and the productivity was affected. Inflation was at its peak. We were suffering from hyperinflation. And hyperinflation is never good in long run. It affected productivity, employment, and further also affected the investments in the economy. Therefore, the government of India had to take quick decision and we adopted the reforms. Now, imbalance of payment. We know this very well that uh, you have studied in macro that balance of payment is mandatory for the health of any economy. 
Now, when there was imbalance of payment, it means we had to make more payments to the rest of the world than what we were receiving from the rest of the world. So this imbalance of payment further caused an additional burden on the foreign exchange reserves. You can see over here, foreign exchange reserves. When there was an additional burden on foreign exchange reserves, the Indian economy had to find a rescue to balance the payments. Therefore, we had to be globalized. And in fact, this was the best remedy for the economy that time. As in the first two chapters, we studied that Indian economy was highly dependent on public sector undertakings. As Indian economy was dependent on public sector undertakings, it's all the budget, made be the revenue or the expenditures, were highly affected by the performance of public sector enterprises or undertakings. Whereas our economy was highly dependent on them, they disappointed the economy highly. They highly disappointed the economy by their performances. And continuous losses by the PSUs made additional burden on Indian financial status. And the last, of course, is low GDP growth. During the period of 80s and 90s, because of all these situations which we just now studied, right from point first to fifth, resulted into poor GDP growth. In other words, we can say that the industrial sector of India could not make any miracles, could not do any miracles to achieve the growth in GDP. Although agriculture was on boom, but service sector and industrial sector were highly backward which could not cover up the losses made in GDP. So these factors became responsible by Indian economy was forced to adopt the new economic reforms. In fact, talking of the government, the government had proudly announced the new economic policies, which is also known as commonly in public known as LPG. Why called as LPG? LPG stands for liberalization, privatization, and globalization. That means under new economic reforms of 1991, we went ahead with liberalization, privatization, and globalization. Now coming to liberalization first. What does liberalization mean? As we are very much familiar with the term liberal. Liberal means to make anything free from the controls. That's what the Indian government did. After becoming liberal economy, the government of India had reduced the control over all the sectors of Indian economy. Several sectors include industrial sector, banking sector, foreign exchange sector, trade sector, and many more. So today we'll be talking about all these sectors one by one. The first we talk here about is industrial sector. Industrial sector, I'll take you back to the topic we talked in the last session, that is IPR 1956. There we studied that the firms were divided into three categories, which was firm A, firm B, and firm C. Firm A had all the control over the production as they were the public sector undertakings. Majority of the industries were undertaken by them. And other industries, other than firm A, B, and C, I mean, sorry, other than firm A, B, and C had to take license from the government. So these license resulted into license raj. Reminding of you of license raj, we had a talk about that this further resulted into license raj. So now the best thing under liberalization which took place was that this industrial licensing policy was completely withdrawn. That means now the entrepreneurs had not to take any permission from the government to start a firm. Although it was not completely withdrawn, it was stuck to some or limited of uh, limited industries as required, which I would talk here in the next point. Then, Many of the private industries were also allowed, which were earlier not allowed to start the production. Next thing, 
some goods which were only in the control of small scale industries. We also studied about SSI in last session that SSI as per the Carvey Committee. Children, I would like to remind you it's a very important one marker. 1955 Carvey Committee had proposed that SSI should be reserved. So under liberalization, we had also de-reserved the small scale industries. Now, anybody, anywhere, in any part of production could have or set up the small-scale industry. In fact, the industrial area could not only be the small-scale industry, could be the large industrial product as well. Coming to the last point, as I told you in the first point, that license was although abolished, but not for all the products. It had still continued with some of the products which, which were actually health and life related products, which were health and life related products, which could challenge the life, which could challenge the health, were still under the license process. One of them was alcohol, then cigarettes, hazardous chemicals, industrial explosives, electronics, aerospace and drug pharmaceuticals, were all these industries which actually were associated with the life and the security of the people. Therefore, they were under the license process of the government. Other than the seven industries, all the industries had been free from the process of license. Here, I would like to tell you children that this, these all seven industries must be known to you because these can be the possible one markers. How? You may be asked about that how or which were the industries which were still taken under the consideration of license. So any of the options can be given to you. You need to select the correct option. And for that, you need to know all these seven names. Hoping you're clear with the industrial sector reforms. I once quickly revise it with you. If you remember IPR 1956, in short, this IPR 1956 had been completely withdrawn. That classification of firm A, B, C had been withdrawn. Reservation of small scale industries had also been withdrawn. And license, which was mandatory for production, had also been abolished other than these seven industries. Now, coming to the next reforms made, which were tax sector reforms. We know this very well that there are two types of taxes majorly, that is direct tax and indirect taxes. The reforms related to taxes were very interesting. And you know, this can be an independent question as well, that what were the reforms made under tax sector under liberalization? So what your answer will be? The first tax reforms were made in the direct taxes. The direct tax, of course, commonly known as income tax, why? Because this is the most prominent tax. It's not so that income tax is the only direct tax. No, I don't mean that. I mean that it is the most prominent tax. So people before or prior to 1991 were in the habit of evading the tax because the tax rates were very high. So the government made the tax rates people friendly or you may say that moderate rates were implemented so that the students could, I'm sorry, so that the people could enjoy the high income with lower rates of taxes. Therefore, the people now were convinced to pay more income taxes. Now comes is the rate of corporation tax. The same with the corporation taxes also. Now the government was more friendly with the corporation tax and it was much higher in collection as not earlier. Now coming to indirect taxes. When it comes to indirect taxes, this has been recently introduced to your syllabus. Uh, in 2018, the government of uh, India has proposed NCRT to add this topic to your syllabus, which is GST, goods and service tax. This can be an independent question as well. And what sort of questions are asked out of this GST? I'll discuss that after teaching this topic and completing this topic. GST, you are all very much aware that was introduced under the Tax Act 2016, I repeat, 
was introduced under the Tax Act 2016. With the improvisations made under the Tax Act 2016, GST came into the force or effect from July or 1st of July 2017. Children, these are two one markers which can possibly be asked to you. I repeat, these are the two one markers which can possibly be asked to you. Now, why did the government introduce this GST? With the consideration that you know the meaning of GST, I go ahead with the uh, promises which were made by the government of India under GST. The first thing the government believed that this will generate additional revenue for the government. This was all, this is also going to help the evasion of the tax because you know the people, especially the kinds of indirect taxes, were highly being evaded by the people. So to avoid this, they wanted one motive to be served, which is one nation, one tax, one market. I repeat, one nation, one tax, one market. So under the umbrella of GST, they subsumed many of the indirect taxes so that the process could be easy, could be convenient to understand, <clears throat> sorry, and could also be comfortable for the foreign investors. Because other than India, there were many other countries who had already adopted GST. So the foreign investors were comfortable with this. So there were many objectives of applying or adopting GST as just now discussed. Now, as I told you that I'll be talking to you about the questions which are asked. So the questions asked out of GST is, of course, when was it implemented? That is July 2017. Second, what are the types of taxes? You're all aware of it. Even then, once I would like to revise that is SGST, CGST, and IGST. Other than these, there is one more which I leave to you, which you need to find out. If you cannot, in next session, I'll help you out with the fourth type of GST. Then there are slabs of GST, which start from 0%. There are certain goods which are free from GST and maximum is more than 24%. Now the objectives I've already discussed. So GST can be an independent topic. Kindly take it very seriously and study it well. This has been incorporated in your syllabus recently. Now, the next reforms I would like to talk to you about is financial sector reforms. This is again a very, very crucial topic. This is generally asked an, as an independent topic. It is also one of the topics which can be a part of the entire topic that is the reforms under liberalization. So financial sector, when you're talking about it, it means you're talking about the banks. And when you're talking about the banks, it means you're talking about the RBI first. This RBI is the apex body in the banking system of India. So when you're talking about RBI, then definitely you need to talk of what and how the role of RBI was affected. Before liberalization, RBI was a controller. RBI was a regulatory body which used to control and regulate the banking system in India. Right from the commercial bank to rural bank, every bank was under RBI and under the monitorship of RBI. But soon the Indian government realized that so much of intervention of the RBI is not letting the commercial banks function properly and smoothly. They're in fact not being encouraged to increase their business or boost their business. So in 1991, the biggest reform which was done in banking sector was that RBI was converted into a facilitator from a regulator. Children, it can be a reason assertion based question also. I repeat, reason assertion based question, which is generally asked out of this part. I think there's a glitch, I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I thankfully got it. So just look at this. That RBI from a regulator became a facilitator. This part is very important. It can be one mark, especially a reason session type of question. Then comes is the reforms or the policies which led further to the establishment of the private banks in India. You know, prior to 1991, the private sector investments in banking of India 
and foreign sector investment in banking of India was very limited. It was highly confined, but then it was liberalized and it was allowed to till 74%. It's a huge percent, you can see. It was allowed to till 74%. Then comes is not only these two. The first point is the major most reform. The second, of course, is not nominal. The third equally is important. That is, for the first time in our banking sectors, we allowed FII, which stands for Foreign Institutional Investment. That means the foreign institutions were also allowed to invest in the banking sectors along with the mutual funds and pension funds. I repeat, these two keywords must be known to you. See, in economics, it is very important to introduce the keywords when you're writing the answer. It really gives weightage to your answer. So these two keywords you must not miss, which is mutual fund and pension funds. So FF, FII will allowed to invest into the banking sector along with the mutual fund and the pension funds of Indian financial market. So these were the serious reforms take, undertaken under the liberalization of financial sector. Then comes foreign exchange reforms. Foreign exchange, that simply means that any other foreign currency other than the Indian currency. That means if you're talking about the foreign exchange, dollar, pound, and any other foreign currency will, of course, be counted as foreign exchange. Now, here we are going to talk about the foreign exchange reserve reforms. As I had already mentioned in the very first topic of this chapter, that there were serious la uh, losses in foreign exchange reserve because of which the Indian government had to seriously work upon the foreign exchange reserve. So to increase the foreign exchange reserves, you know, you have studied in macroeconomics that to increase the foreign exchange reserves, the best way is to boost exports from the economy and reduce imports from the rest of the world. In other words, the inflow of foreign currency much, must be much more than the outflow of the foreign currency. And to resolve this problem in 1991, a very typical step was taken and that was that rupee was devalued in order to attract foreign investment, in order to attract the investors towards our country, in order to encourage exports from our country, we intentionally devalued our rupee. Now you must be thinking what is devaluation, although it, I'll cover it in detail in macroeconomics topic, foreign exchange reserve, but in short, devaluation of a currency means the loss of the domestic currency's value. And that too, which is done by the government with some intentions. So that time we devalued our currency. Now why? A devalued currency means the foreign countries or the other countries or the rest of the world have to make lesser payments. I repeat, they have to make the lesser payments in order to buy anything from our country. In fact, the investment also becomes cheaper. So devaluation encourages, devaluation encourages the reserves of our current country as investment and exports are also encouraged. <clears throat> Now, trade and investment policy reforms. We had studied about import substitution policy in the last session, that import substitution, which allowed encouragement of export and discouragement of imports by the restriction of quantitative policies, which were tariffs and quotas. I have already explained all these in the last session. You can refer to the last video if not heard that. So what was there in these reforms? Whatever reforms were there during 1991 related to the import and export reforms, first thing was dismantling the quantitative or quota restrictions on imports. You know, no country is full. If they are talking to you about liberalization that means they know that you are stopping them to export their goods by quota 
policies or tariff policies so if you want to be friendly with them if you want to have healthy trade relations with them you first of all need to remove all the restrictions you have put on their business so the rest of the world demanded india that you first of all remove the quantity restriction and the tariff restriction you have implied on our exports and that's what we had to do we had to first of all withdraw the quantitative restriction the second we also had to modify that means reduce the tariff rates that means the taxes which we levied on the export and import were also modified and the third there were strict license policies for trading with the rest of the world that was also liberalized that means license for import of most of the things other than two cases that is the cases of hazard and the cases of the environmentally sensitive industries other than two these two cases license was no more required i hope these three points are clear i correlated to the last topic we covered that is import substitution in the last session there we studied about quantitative restriction tariff restriction and uh, implementation of license so all these three were withdrawn now after liberalization the next topic we need to cover up about is privatization this is a very common term we know what privatization is even then when it comes to definition we need to go systematically with the statement what is it privatization means shedding off the ownership of management i repeat shedding off the ownership or management of the government owned enterprise that means the company is no more owned and controlled or managed by the government sector it is managed by the private or individual firm in future so this process of privatization undertakes place in two ways specially the first is the withdrawal of the government from the ownership the withdrawal of the government from the ownership can be best understood by the recent example of the airports majority of major or good earning airports or you may say the big airports of india have been handed over to the private ownership for their maintenance and their smooth running here the government has withdrawn and has handed over the management of these airports to the private ownership this is a kind of privatization in airports then second is the outright sale outright sale is directly to sell out the public sector companies when the government of india or any other country is planning to sell off its owned economy companies that is public sector undertakings or public sector enterprises to a private ownership that's known as outright sale for example air india that can be the best example and the most recent example that air india which has been completely sold out and has been taken up by tata group of companies is the example for privatization so these are the two ways popularly taking place under privatization now when we are talking about privatization we cannot miss one very important point which is disinvestment you can see over there on your screen disinvestment it's a term which is very much known to the commerce students of course may not that well be known to humanity students and science students of economics but yes for commerce student it is very well known but even then i would like to highlight once the meaning of disinvestment it simply means that selling off the part of i repeat selling off the part of the equity of the pscs or public sector undertakings so when the government sells off some part or fraction or the equities of the undertakings or enterprises is known as disinvestment here the most common and popular example can be taken is the recent example of disinvestment in lic 
we know this very well that government has done disinvestment multiple other times in past but lic has been one of the most talked disinvestment ever taken place in indian economy as in lic the government has sold off its equity or is in the process of doing so for a huge amount so this investment has been an indispensable part of privatization now why does the government do this disinvestment why does the government lose off its ownership especially the concerns like lic when we hear of lic we hear of bhel we hear of ongc and many more names these are the pride of indian government and indian economy then why does the government do this investment of such huge enterprises they the reasons are the first is it's the purpose of the sale of these equities and the share is as for the welfare of the economy it's done by the government to improve the financial discipline and facilitate the modernization financial discipline that means the government is some way or the other struggling with the budget system is also struggling with the <coughs> excuse me is also struggling with the management of the fund so where does the government go for is it good to borrow the money from the international sources time and again no it's not it's always better to arrange the fund from the domestic sources so this investment is considered to be one of the safest method of arranging the funds second is modernization now when you disinvest the parts of public sector undertakings and is being undertaken sometimes by the foreign investors and also the private investors it can have betterment in the modernization can also have the better in the uh, way of management can also be better in modus operandi of the production therefore privatization undertakes with the help of disinvestment then comes is globalization globalization is something not new to you you have studied about it in class 10th as well in detail there was a detailed chapter about it now what is globalization it's a simple process under which we integrate the economies integrate the economies means we integrate the domestic economy with the rest of the world how do we do this it's not an easy process it is done with the help of foreign investments it is done with the help of foreign direct investments sometimes indirect investments as well it is done with the help of trading process that means buying and selling the goods and products that is import and exports sometimes exchanges with the services are also taking part in the globalization and many more ways so becoming interdependent is known as globalization now globalization has many ways as i just mentioned i repeat foreign direct investment foreign indirect investment sometimes trading can be the part of and of course opening up of mncs that is multinational corporations are the parts of globalization but the name which has been very popularly used in india and has been there in your ncrt textbook that is why i'm talking to you about this that is outsourcing what is outsourcing you are very smart to know about it i know that you are very much aware of this word outsourcing it simply means that when a company is hiring some external sources or hiring some uh, services from the other companies to fulfill the responsibilities and to get the work done is known as outsourcing for example you must have received multiple calls from the mobile companies offering you so many services like customer service sometimes you receive the calls for credit card sometimes you receive the calls or you even call the customer care for banking related issues or many more things so when we are talking to these people who are providing us the service providing us the service as customer service provider who are they are they the part of banks are they really the parts of the mobile companies no not all base these are the people who have been hired by the banks who have been hired by the 
mobile companies, that means the communication companies, to provide you the customer service. So such services are called as outsourcing. You know what? There's a question. I give you a bonus question over here. This is very, very favorite question of NCRT question paper setters. That is why is India a favorite outsourcing destination to the world? I repeat, why is India a favorite outsourcing destination to the world? Here is the answer. India has been offering so many outsourcing services, right from legal, computers, advertisements, security, banking, and many more. But how come it be possible? It could be possible with the help of the establishment of BPO, or very, very popularly we call it as call centers. And I know you are aware of it. So why do the people come here in India to establish their BPO or to hire or outsource the BPS from India? There are two major reasons. The first is the Indian are very good at their communication skills. So their communication proficiency helps the foreign companies to get the work done easy. And of course, they are equally IT skilled. So these two things make the work easy for the foreign companies. Now, second thing is, it's not all about the skills only. It's also about the benefit and cost cutting. So when the foreign companies are coming to India to hire the services, I hope you are taking a note of it. If not, please, I repeat, note it down. The, so the first reason is the skill which we have, that is the communication skill or the language proficiency, and also the IT skills or information technology skills, which help the work to be done easily. And secondly, of course, is the cost cutting. So when the people from India are hired with all these efficiencies at the lower cost, then India itself becomes a favorite destination for the foreign investors. Now, when we are talking about globalization, we cannot forget to talk about World Trade Organization. This chapter, sorry, this topic is actually uh, commonly used for one markers. Therefore, my highlight will be on the first point. What is WTO? WTO was founded in the year 1995. Children, it can be a possible one marker. 1995 as the successor organization of GATT. This is General Agreement on Trade and Tariff. This is known as GATT. So GATT was established in the year 1948 with only 23 countries. Later on, with the success of GATT, the global Trade organization was established with the target and the objective of satisfying the trade needs of the world. So how does it work? How does WTO work? It actually has a very uh, crucial role in the trading industry of the world. It also does have important role to play. That's not a thing to be discussed over here. It's just to know that it works with the help of multilateral trade agreements. I repeat, it works with the multilateral trade agreement because the World Trade Organization offers multilateral trade agreements, which is to be signed by the member countries. Under this agreement, all the member countries are given up with the equal opportunities. I repeat, they're offered with the equal opportunities with no bias uh, approaches or no biasness of the developed countries toward developing countries. In fact, it helps to resolve the issues related to the trade services, or it also helps to resolve the problems related to the taxation tariffs and the quantity of the goods and services traded. Now, the trade agreement can be bilateral and multilateral both. I repeat, it can be bilateral and multilateral both. It is especially about the removal of tariffs, non-tariff barriers, and also providing the greater market access to all the member countries. So these three are the major objectives of WTO. If you are in case asked this, you need to remember that removal of tariffs, 
that is non-tariff barriers and providing greater market access to all the member countries, including the trade agreement for, for the equal opportunity for all the member countries are the objectives of World Trade Organization. Now, we have so far discussed about liberalization and the policies, privatization, and of course, globalization, along with the outsourcing and World Trade Organization. A very important question asked out of this, which is analytical question, where you must note the data is down and you must mention the data is there in your answer also. So how these reforms made impact on Indian economy? First, I would talk about positive. Positive is always good to start, no? So what was the positive impact? First of all, our GDP. It increased from 5.6% average to 8.2%, you can see there was a great jump. This was all because of the investments made in the country. But majorly, this GDP was affected by the growth of service sector in India. This reasons of growth of service sector and its uh, huge impact and all will be discussed in the next chapter of ID. Second is, when we opened the economy for the rest of the world, it increased the foreign direct investment, which is known as FDI, a very common term nowadays used everywhere, and also affected the foreign exchange reserves. Of course, when you allow the import and exports to be done freely, foreigners are coming to invest in your country, they'll come with their foreign exchanges and will enhance the foreign exchange reserve of your country. So it increased from about 100 million USD to, please note, there's a remarkable change, to 30 billion USD. There's a huge and great jump. You can see a leap. This is from 100 million to 30 billion. So it was a it was a remarkable achievement as we were struggling a lot in the foreign exchange reserves. Then there has been also a change in the reserves of not only foreign exchange, but also the holding of the foreign exchange. So India became one of the largest foreign exchange reserve holder in the world. Now let us talk about some of the negative impacts as Indian economists and the other economists have always criticized the liberalization, privatization, globalization to be adopted in, in India in 1991. So what were they? The first is, growth and employment, you know, GDP, of course, grew from 5.7% to 8 point something, but job did not grow. In comparison to GDP, employment percentage was always low, which situation is very, very commonly known as jobless growth. Children, it can be a one marker and can also be asked like this, that what were the reasons behind the jobless growth? So what is jobless growth? Jobless growth is a situation where the growth is there. That means GDP is growing, but is not generating the jobs or employment why could and how could it be possible? It could be possible because of the cost cutting adopted by the foreign companies or MNCs. It could also be possible with the uses of IT information technology, where the people could easily be replaced by machines. Then is reforms in agriculture. We have studied in the first chap uh, first two chapters in the last session, of course, that agriculture sector was positively affected by green revolution, we became independent or self-dependent in agricultural sector. But, but as soon as this IPR 1956, I'm sorry, as soon as the NEB 1991 was introduced, agriculture sector was highly neglected. As the fund which was being diverted towards green revolution for the growth of infrastructure, storage, HYB seeds, fertilizers, chemicals, and of course, subsidies. These all the amounts had been diverted. These all funds had been diverted towards the industrial and service sector growth. In fact, subsidy had also been reduced to an extent. So the worst affected sector during reforms was agricultural sector because nothing positive could be done to the farmers other than export of the producers to the rest of the world became easy for them. Next, industry. Of course, industry was doing well. It was growing. 
and it could record the growth if, in multiple sectors. But when you talk about the cottage industry, small scale industries completely had to struggle and had to compete with the huge industries which had come from the rest of the world. It was not easy for the domestic countries to compete with the rest of the world or the competition was very tough as they were not prepared. They always had enjoyed the monopoly. They did not have the machines to compete with. They did not have the modus operandi and management so skilled and efficient to compete with. In fact, their pricing, that means cost, was also not sufficient to compete with the rest of the world. So multiple industries struggled Many of them had decided to have merger with them and many of them actually were declared as sick industry and they had to shut down. Disinvestment. There had been a process of disinvestment which started with a few lakhs rupees, but now it's been a number of multiple zeros. So the wider is disinvestment, the huge is disinvestment, the more is the risk of the loss of economic sovereignty of Indian economy. And of course, the more we disinvest, a time will come and we need to think over that whether we are on the right path and the fiscal policies. See, we definitely made so many changes in privatization, globalization, but certain fiscal policies were negatively affected. When we discuss about the government budget, there we'll discuss about this in detail. But in short, I would like to tell you one small example, which is their case study in your textbook as well. That is Sarsila tragedy. We cannot forget about Sarsila, which is a place in Andhra Pradesh. It's a place for the weavers. The weavers who were the weaver of the clothes, saris especially in Sarsila, they were dependent on power loom. But... Soon the privatization took place in this state, the prices or the cost for energy became so high that for them to meet the cost was not that easy. Therefore, either they had to decide to shut the production down or they had to switch their employment or jobs. But everybody could not be easy to handle with this crisis and there were multiple suicides taken place in Sarsila. That is why we call it as Sarsila tragedy. Thank you so much. That's it for this chapter. Today we have completed the first two units successfully for ID. These are uh, the chapters or the portions with the highest weightage. Other than this is chapter 10. And next we'll discuss about the challenges of Indian economy in detail in the next session. Thank you so much.